All right, out on Peaceville Records, Tourniquets, Hacksaws, and Graves. A call to Chris Reefert, my fellow musician friend. And here we go. Chris. Yeah. Hey, is this the right phone? Yeah, this is perfect, man. This is great. <laughs> Dude, you can hear me, too. That's what's even better. Yeah, I can hear you. You got the magic number and everything, man. How's it going? Good. This is cool. Again, glad to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. A little bit of a, you know, day off <laughs> trying to get things organized. Hey, what the hell, man? Right, right. Well, the main thing I want to rap about is, like, current stuff, because it's coming up quick. You're doing a lot of things, and I'm going to be a little um, naive at first, so um, let me... <laughs> That's I okay. Story of my life, man. got my hi-hat ringing right here. It's like it's totally in the oh, way. Oh, sweet. I'm All right. <laughs> hi-hat and beer. Oh, dude. It's like peanut butter and chocolate, only better. <laughs> yeah. It's a new album uh, from Autopsy called High Hats and Beer. Yeah. Hacksaws. <laughs> Dude, I gotta say, man, that Red House beer was dynamite. Oh, cool. I'm glad that you yeah, that was, to give that to you. That was amazing. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. That was fucking absolutely delicious. It's so good to have beer and play heavy. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And speaking of heavy, you. Um, oh, shit. God, I love this. Um, tonight we're going to be blasting it a lot more. And then when this is fun, this is just talking to you in between the scenes of all this and what's going on. And we will also talk about some of the stuff that you do other than, uh, you know, autopsy. But right now I want to focus on autopsy. It's looking like this record is called. Uh, tourniquets, hacksaws, and graves. That is correct, sir. Who is the artist? Oh, the guy that did the front cover is uh, Wes Benscotter. Yes. <clears throat> he's, uh, he did our uh, Macabre Eternal cover. Um, and he's done a bunch of, and he's you know pretty well known in the in the metal world and stuff. He's he's done a lot of uh, really cool shit, but like. I do think he kind of outdid himself on this new one, personally. It's, Definitely. I love it, man. It's fucking turned out pretty badass. It is so, so heavy, and uh, I like, you know, I was talking with Eric this morning about things that we're doing, and the main things that come up sometimes aren't just the music. It's, you know, how can we present our music? How are we packaging this? So the next thing to ask you would be, before you hire him again, or let's bring him back on a record, or let's not use him, do you guys all powwow that, or does he come from one energy, you know, one engine, one brain, um, or what? How's that all work for autopsy as far as packaging your material? Um, it just depends. I mean, there's a few really, really good artists we've had the privilege to work with, and Wes is one of them. And you know, we 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 seem to kind of rotate between the different artists usually. Um, it just kind of depends on the, the mood of the album, I guess. Uh, you know, I was kind of, you know, open to, you know, different ideas this time around, and a couple of the guys were really pushing for Wes, and I didn't see any problem with that. <laughs> it was like already, you know, we'd already worked with him, and he was cool to work with and did really, really good stuff. And so it was just a matter of dropping him an email and see if he was interested, and he was. And that was it. So it wasn't really a big discussion about it, you know. It's just... Sure. You know, a couple, a couple of guys said, "Hey, let's work with Wes." You know, he's a badass, and sure. you know, I said, "Yeah, okay, that sounds like it makes sense to me." And you know, he definitely, uh, you know, captured the vibe and stuff. So uh, he didn't really have anything to go on, which is even more to his credit. You know, I gave him like the the album title and, and the lyrics to the song, and he completely ignored the lyrics to the song, <laughs> which probably is for the best. You know, he didn't want to. Uh, <laughs> he was. It's it's a good thing. He was sort of uh, not wanting to uh, come up with something sort of like cliche, you know, for, you know, death metal cover. Right? With a title like that, you can easily fall into that territory because it is kind of a, <laughs> you know, dare I say a typical sort of death metal glory uh, title. And he didn't want to do something that was, 
just obvious. So he kind of racked his brain for a while and came up with this concept. And it, uh, yeah, it was all his idea. We gave him a couple of little sort of nitpicky suggestions and to the point where we were starting to work his nerves. <laughs> and then it was just like, okay, guys, here's your cover. <laughs> awesome. And uh, yeah, man, fucking, it, it turned out really good. I'm, I'm super, super psyched about it. Well, it's great. And I swear, vinyl, you know, even CDs, you could kick back on that couch and you crank in it for the first time and you look at that, just you're looking at the artwork, but now you're hearing hearing the work, the music, and it, it just generates a whole different, you know, experience behind listening rather than just, you know, blindly clicking on a title of a track without seeing artwork and... Um, I don't know if I've been an abuser of that. Like, where I can now, there's no way. I love art too much. I like looking at stuff and hearing it, you know. And it just oh yeah makes all the difference. That's, that's that's what makes it an experience instead of just something in the background. Is actually like you know I probably had the same you know or similar experience as you. You know, growing up getting a record and just literally staring at the album cover for the whole time you're listening and just Blow reading away. everything. You know the looking at the band pictures and reading all the little notes and the, you know, everything just devouring the whole thing and kind of forget where you are and who you are while you're listening. You're just too busy being in this little world. You right, know, it's like, great. And I, <laughs> I still treat albums that way to this day. And I need the CDs, man. I'll read like every little thing in the booklet and, you know, come on, man. It's just, that's how, that's how it's uh, meant to be enjoyed. Definitely, I think that's killer. I mean, you remember the <laughs> some of the Cheech and Chong records? Oh yeah, yeah, I still have those with the big, uh, big bamboo big rolling bam- paper and everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Like uh, Alice Cooper, Billion Dollar Babies. It opens up. You get a dollar bill in there. I mean, a billion dollar giant poster. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, I still have that too. Or all the Kiss records, all the treats you get in there. The yeah. little popping love gun, or the tattoos, or the booklets the stickers posters Sticker, all that yeah man. there's nothing like that's it that's priceless even like yeah, uh, totally. it's weird the uh, remember the was it physical graffiti <laughs> it looks like an advent calendar look at these little windows yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's oh man 70s album covers are awesome or like rolling stone some girls cover oh. or fucking, uh another cool one's uh the sweet give us a wink with a winking eye you know yeah that's another really great album Right heap, look at yourself, you know, that little wind mirror. <laughs> and you're yeah, like, the little mirror that doesn't quite work, but it's still really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you look like this uh, bizarre alien or something. Yeah, uh, oh man, me. yeah, that's a great album. That, yeah, oh, they just don't make things like that anymore. <laughs> well, I'm hearing a lot of great stuff on this record, and uh, that art is part of you guys. It's just something in, in you guys. Humor, art. I've loved all your covers. I mean, we still talk about shit fun all the time. I, <laughs> anyone who's never heard of Autopsy, <laughs> I go, you got to see this. Yeah, that's kind of the sore thumb of the bunch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of, uh, you know, said what we needed to say at the time, I guess. <laughs> right. Now, last interview when I talked about that, you said that you couldn't even let your son. Now, is that true again is <laughs> you had to like maybe hold that back from letting your kids see the album or something uh yeah i wasn't ready to let them see that one <laughs> you know I, now i don't care i mean he's old enough but just he doesn't care at all i mean we got the i got the actual uh box of records yesterday the new album and and he got home from school and like hey we got the new records want to see it and he's like okay he picked it up and he looked at it and he turned it around he said cool and then went up to his room to play video games <laughs> so <laughs> you know he doesn't he doesn't care that's awesome you know that's yeah good. so yeah he's doing his own thing you know so that's fine well it's kind of what we did you know so yeah 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 exactly my, st- a, my more like with my dad, he wanted to, you know, throw the baseball around. It was sort of like, and the cat's in the cradle, and that. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to go uh, slam some, you know, double bass, try and figure this out. Um, but <laughs> anyway, let's go back to the album, Tourniquets, Hacksaws, and Graves. And let's start, I'm going to try and go through these songs. They might not be in order, but I would like for you to just have fun, talk about it. Um, 
talk about it any way you want, but if you could talk about it, did lyrics appear and uh, on this one, like is some of the the ways it came together? Was it a pre-pro? Was it a y'all got in the same room? Um, no, I had a cassette, you know, or we, you know, cassette. But I brought in something, or I just played this riff, and then we all started attacking. And, and had- yeah, yeah, that's the opening cut, huh? Yeah. So can you talk well, a little bit about what you feel about it? Why is it the opening cut, blah, blah, blah? Just go to town on this. Yeah, well, it just seemed like a good opening cut. It, you know, comes in pretty slam, and it's got the, you know, I don't know what you call them. We call them bumps, the bump, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. That Those are always good to, to start with the cymbal chokes and all that stuff. Um, it just seemed like a good, aggressive way to start the album, you know, just, you know, it's like we're not we're not here to romance you. <laughs> you know, we're here to kick your ass, you know, that kind of thing. So it seemed like a good one to start with musically and then um you know the lyrics it's uh um i read a book called uh castaways by this guy named brian Keane. it is really it's a really fucking cool book and and uh i kind of got the well not kind of i blatantly got inspiration from that and cool. pretty much wrote about that story and uh you know that's where that one came from it's in the in the book it's like kind of based on a reality show like you know survivor or one of those kind of things but like there's these sort of like mutant, cryptid, cannibal thing to live on the island, and they start, you know, one by one, picking everyone off and feeding them and, you know. Awesome. And mating with them and, you know, all that good kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's a really cool story. Anything by Brian King is actually badass. Cool. That sounds yeah, killer, yeah. killer. As far as musically, then, is it bass-led? Is it drum-led? Or was it from, um, like you just said, lyric-led? Le- uh, I don't know. It's just just about it's everything-led, I guess, on that. I mean, it's just pretty much pretty fast, you know. It's got the fast drums and fast guitars and everything else. And it actually, actually there's no tempo changes in that song. It's just fast from, from start to finish, you know. So oh. as, usually we have all these, you know, changes like you know we're going real fast and then all of a sudden the doom part comes and whatever but on that one there's none of that it's just in and out just really fast and seemed like a good way to just kind of grab you by the face and face and uh you know start the album off brutally sure sure well that's killer man i think when i ask that but we'll do it on this next one let's go with king of flesh and then uh it says ripped so is it king of flesh ripped yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was uh, Eric wrote that one. He he wrote the uh, the lyrics and the music. I know he um, he got the idea lyrically from this movie called Ichi the Killer, and um, I haven't seen that yet, but so I can't really go into uh, too much detail about that. But it's sort of in the lyrics. It's uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it's almost. It seems like it's almost like a uh, sort of like a torture contest, like who can endure the most uh, self-inflicted torture, that kind of thing. Wow. So again, I haven't seen the movie, so you know, I'm not I'm probably not the one to talk to about the lyrics on that. But you know, they're definitely you know, gory and torturous and all that. And uh, yeah, the music uh, Eric wrote that too. So you know, I can't really uh, tell you what was going through his head, but it seemed to. Uh, be a good, uh, you know, second cut for the album. Over all of these songs, what do you think is your slowest? Let's go that way. And we're just going to pull these out. Somebody, like, hey, I'm going to check track 11 out, go out of sequence of the record. Oh, no problem. Yeah, the slowest one, there's a couple that are pretty slow. Well, the Howling Dead, um, that's one that was actually oh. coming up after Tourniquets. And that's, there's no fast parts on that. It's pretty much different uh, shades of flow. <laughs> That's groovy, you know, too. Uh, That's one of my favorites. Oh, cool. It's a weird one. You know, it's one that uh, a couple people might have kind of an issue getting their heads around it, but, you know, it's okay. I mean, we like how it came out. And, yeah, it's definitely, like I said, different shades of slow, you know, I mean, from just all out doom to just weird to kind of, you know, almost sort of that Black Sabbath 
groove kind of thing at times, but, uh, you know, just trying to keep it as heavy as possible. So that's one. And then, uh, let's see, Burial's another one. That one's pretty damn doomy. Um, yeah, definitely, these are the two. Definitely some trouble in there. <laughs> they uh, may or may not have noticed. Um, you know, so that's that one's just pretty damn slow. And then at the end, it, there's kind of a, a fast burst of craziness just to just to snap you out of the out of the zone and uh, end on a, a really crazy note. So that one's pretty pretty slow. And then there's another one called uh, Deep Crimson Dreaming, and that yeah. one's pretty pretty doomy, I guess, but kind of almost kind of rocking at the same time. I don't cool. know if that's a good way to put it. You know, death metal fans might hear that and go, "Fuck you." <laughs> you I don't know, know, you know, but, uh, uh, groove death metal, you know, fucking groove. Well, it's just trying to keep it interesting for ourselves and maybe other people too. But that one's pretty. That one's kind of a weird song too, you know. But there's plenty of plenty of slow stuff in there and takes some kind of odd twists and turns and stuff like that. So yeah, trying to keep it interesting and not do the same thing every time. You know, that's something that, that we always go for. I mean. With, like to keep our, uh, our our sound, so to speak, but not like repeat ourselves either. So you know, it's kind of good. Keep you on your toes. Yeah. Well, the Howling Dead. I wouldn't say trouble, man. I'd say Sabbath. But it's oh, one that of them, one, dude. It's one of them. There's some riffs in there that are so so killer. It's I don't know if you've ever heard a record and go, God, I wish I wrote that. <laughs> oh, all the time, dude. <laughs> I was like, "That is just awesome!" Like, <laughs> oh, cool. That's the only Love one me. that Eric and I actually sat down and wrote together. The Howling Dead. Every, all the other songs, everyone wrote separately. You know, musically, which is pretty much how we usually do it. You know, everyone, you know, whoever's got a song, they're like, "Hey, I got one." Let's learn it. You know, and then uh, we've only done that a couple times before. Actually, like sat down together and you know worked on riffs and that was one like he had some riffs and i had a couple you know kind of like floater ones and we ended up putting them together and came up with another one or two to kind of stitch it all together and it came out really cool man so that's kind of unique in that way you know it kind of makes it makes for a weird ride Excellent, excellent. Well, it's a great ride every time. And uh, I mean, is there anything that sticks out about it? Um, should we go with an? Is there anything you didn't like about it? <laughs> That'd be crazy. Uh, how long? No, it took? no. Was there any hassles during it, or uh, was it all good? Oh, during recording, or yeah, no, everything was pretty. I mean, we we show up pretty pretty well rehearsed, you know. When it comes time to do an album we can you know dick around for months and that kind of thing but you know if we have something going on whether it's a show or you know an album or something we'll you know definitely put in a couple extra practices or whatever it takes and you know work really hard at it i mean there was well a couple of songs were really last minute um you know learning them like right before recording and so that was a little bit intense you know just making sure we knew what the hell we were doing. And uh, it turned out okay, you know. Well, more than okay. I'm actually really happy with everything. But uh, that's that's part for the course. We usually have a couple like that that, you know, we'll get down like a week before we awesome. <laughs> go ahead and record. So you got to be, you know, definitely putting the work in. But, uh, you know, once we get there, it's it's smooth, you know. And the place we go to is great. And we've been working with that engineer for... Um, Oh, like 14 years off and on, even oh, before Autopsy awesome. got back together, we were working with him. So, you know, it's once we get in the studio, it's all good, you know. Just uh, crack open some beers and, and uh, get to it. Yeah, well, that's priceless if you got that connection because now you can hear the similarities of past records, but new ideas or, you know, let's bring back, you know, the gems that we once were, you know. The history. How long of a career have you guys had, Chris? Just to make it an interview question. Oh, autopsy. Yeah. Um, well, we started in '87, and then we went at it till like '94. Then we split up, and we stayed split up for about 15 years. But you know, we were all 
doing other things, you know, like Danny and I and Joe, we had abscess going for like 15 years. And stuff, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't really a break, but a break from that band. Yeah. And then, you know, we got back together in 2009 and we're still going. So, you know, uh, we had like a long intermission, but, you know, so God, it's like, you know, basically 27 years, you know, cause even, you know, as you know, even when a band is not active, there's still things going on, whether it's like reissues or, you know, like a DVD or something. I mean, there's a, there's hopefully anyways, always interest and, you know, questions to be answered and things like that. So yeah. it's not like, you know, when you make a record, it's like kind of having kids, you know, they, it doesn't just go away, you know, and so you all have to sort of still be in contact with each other and, you know, address certain things and, you know, you're putting that record out into the world and, you know, hopefully it stays around and keeps people talking, even if the band isn't doing anything. Oh, that's giant right there. And then there's always the coolest thing is uh, festivals asking you to come and play the whole, you know, Maccabee Eternal record and from its entirety. Have you have have you had any offers like that? No, nah, I mean, there's probably people that would like to, you know, do something like that. I mean, that. I didn't even realize it, but, you know, we've been seeing these, like, posts on our site, like, oh, you know, Seven Survival, your first album, you know, 25 years old now, and I've heard things like, oh, you should play that whole thing live, and that kind of thing, but we've never done that or even really thought about it, you know. And, um, we've definitely done the, the festival thing a bunch of times in a bunch of places, but it's always kind of just a mix of, of this and that. That's kind of fun for us, just plucking out the the favorite songs from all the albums and trying to make it a well-rounded thing and, you know, the gems. packing as much cool stuff in there as we can from, you know, different albums and stuff. Cool, man. Cool. Well, as always, I said this on the last interview, let's shift some gears. All um, right, I'm ready. <laughs> it might not be as zany today. We're like, so we're kind of like, it's a chill interview. It's a relaxing interview. Oh, it's a, yeah, we were, we were actually blasting the album last night because we just got it. And yeah. They ended up staying up pretty late and kind of just yeah that's the fun way to do <laughs> the coffee, it dude the coffee's almost working but not quite so yeah i'm feeling <laughs> a little bit low-key today so if you don't mind well no no problem i'm on the east coast and you know i'm only at you know cracking my first uh allagash saison we just put out a new saison i'll send you some of this as courtesy of the interview as oh always. sweet yeah that's awesome What's fun is that you're almost like a beer friend now. I can just like, here you go, try this. What do you think? Oh, cool, fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm totally cool with that. I have no complaints. So weird. Uh, in the news, more relevant, like what what we did, uh, Chris. We had sent Odorous a long time ago some beer, and I remember him going, "Fuck, dude, you can do an interview anytime you want." You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I know, man. That was that was a shock hearing about him. There's been a lot of shockers, you know. Was it Solitude yeah. Eternus too, or you know, uh, uh, Jason? Or if I'm getting that wrong, I'm probably getting it wrong. I gotta edit it. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's, that's the beauty of editing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dumbass old fart comments now. You know, it is. Um, <laughs> gear shifting. <laughs> about your actual setups and we're going to do it this way we're going to do it we're going to talk about guitar and we'll talk about some of the equipment and we'll talk about um your drum equipment and even your mics you like to use um sometimes real those real geeky deep fans they want to get into like what is that you know why what kind of symbols and and does he just get whatever he can get, you know? So um, we don't have to get too detailed, but you can't, we can put it that way. So let's start with, so for autopsy, drumming and singing, right? Do you, or do you grab the guitar for that as well? Oh, well, yeah, any guitar-related stuff for autopsy is just at home. You know, like if I'm writing something, I'll just I'll write it at home. And then, you know, once we all get together for autopsy, there's there's no guitar going on unless I'm actually like showing someone my, you know showing them one of my songs and i have to you know play it for them of course and everyone okay. learns it just like you know just like when anyone else has a new song only 
if it's not one of mine, I'll actually be behind the drums and trying to think of, you know, beats and stuff to do. But otherwise, yeah, uh, pretty minimal guitar involvement in autopsy. Cool. Um, so then let's stick with autopsy drum wise, uh, symbols of choice or, you know, what, what, um, what do you like to use and you know, <laughs> how many is, and what's it like? This is where I start to fail. I am the worst person to talk to about gear. I'm kind of like an anti gear well, That's awesome. Gear nut, make it you know, I just, <laughs> yeah, I'll try to make it fun. I mean, no, a lot of, sometimes I'll just fun. go, Are I don't know. <laughs> sometimes I'll just I don't know what I have. It's just stuff that <laughs> I get. <laughs> it's like, I just don't, I don't know, man. I should care more about my gear, but I just don't. You know, I wait. Awesome. Sometimes the guys will get mad at me because it just starts falling apart. And, like, yes. you know, our bass player, Joe, one day he just showed up with a bag full of, like, bolts and washers and stuff. He's like, here, put these fucking things on your drums. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It's just bad, man. But uh, I, I do have a, uh, it's true, symbols, just whatever. I, I can afford. I, mean, I like <laughs> anything that makes uh, symbol-y sounds. <laughs> and it doesn't have like a million holes in it. Or, uh, weird chips and cracks, but that, oh, God. You know, that isn't, happens anyways over time. They're expensive. So I don't replace things very often. I wait until they beyond repair, and then I suck it up and you know, buy something or you know, whatever, but, um, you know, I, I have, uh, kind of like Jildjian and Sadian, I think, um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, that after a while, the, the logo gets worn off, and you can't see it anymore, so it just looks like blank symbols, <laughs> I think that's what they are, though, you can almost go beyond on that, um, the kid <laughs> is, I do know what kind of kid it is, it's, a uh, Premier Cabria, which is, it's like the low end for Premier, but, Nice. But they don't really make bad stuff, you know. It was, it was the one I could afford at the time, you know. Sure. And I, uh, I had to go on a mission for that. I was on this crazy Keith Moon obsession. I'm like, I have to play premier drums because that's what Keith Moon played. So I went to all these music stores, and all they wanted to do was sell me stuff they had on the floor, you know. Like, hey, <laughs> you want these? I'm like, no, I don't want those. So I eventually went to this place over in Sacramento, which is about an hour drive from here, and they were the only ones willing to actually order it. So they actually ordered it, and it actually came by boat. So it took like six months to get the fucking set, and uh, so I was happy. Like, okay, I got my premieres, because you couldn't get them anywhere over here. I actually had an order from England. But um, so I do know what that what my kid is. <laughs> That's awesome. Hardware and all that, it's just a mix of whatever. You know, I mean, that shit breaks constantly, so just, <laughs> I usually get cheap stuff. Just what? I, yeah, I mean, just I don't like to invest money, and in, someone should endorse me, man. That would be great. <laughs> then I could just like have good stuff for once in my life instead of just a bunch of fucking broken down garbage. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I usually buy cheap like stands and pedals, and they never last. So I I never remember what I have because it's always something different. It's, it's kick drum pedals, man. What the hell? They there we go. Never need to last. There's always like a spring flying off or fucking something. It's like, God. I tried getting really like expensive ones. I actually tried that and it seems like there was just more springs to go flying off. I'm like, okay, well, I really don't know where this part goes. I have no idea. So I kind of just go back to the real basic ones where you can look at it and see how it works. <laughs> okay, this bolt came off. It's got to go here because it's the only place, you know? <laughs> I love that, dude. That's like the uh, coolest, you know, equipment question. I'm laughing because, you know, I'm the same way. And I'm glad. Oh, that's refreshing to hear, man. Oh, that's great. You know, I with that's... symbols, they just, they break. I got a symbol. Not I don't even meter. know how to say it. I don't even, it's called a, I'm going to, it's right here. I had to get it in Europe because it, my, I had a cool, uh, remember those uh, pasty roods? I was yeah. using those, but they, would, they wouldn't they would crack. They would dent and just stop ringing. <laughs> they yeah, dented. Uh, it was yeah. like a different kind of metal. But It just would turn into a clunk instead of a crack. <laughs> yeah. Like, at least the, like the, the other, you know, kinds of, I don't know what the metallurgical term would be, or, or cast, or, you know, the way that they're, you know, melted, or <laughs> they crack, they can still ring yeah. a little bit. 
But I have yeah, right here a... I have a Zoltan. I don't even know what the brand that is. I don't even know if it exists. I don't know if I like... You know, it's like those... When people sell watches on the streets. I was in Europe and yeah. I bought a, Zolt, a Zoltan <laughs> ride. <laughs> nice. I but think I I've like heard yours. Of that I like your symbols. They're generic because you can't read them anymore. So they're. Symbol. It doesn't matter as long as they sound cool, you know. At least I have some that actually don't have holes in them yet. That's the best. And you actually get like a hole yeah. in the middle of the symbol, you know. Like how how does that happen? <laughs> you get this little chip. You can like throw at people and stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Then there's eBay where you can crank on some, you know. Wow, I can buy that symbol for thirty five bucks, and then you get it, and you realize, oh man, it's been really played. <laughs> like, it's it really bad. is a thirty five dollar symbol. Yeah, <laughs> it is a thirty five dollar symbol instead of a three hundred and fifty. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, man, symbols you can pay as much as you want for them. It's crazy. Anything with drums, man, it's an expensive instrument to pick up. Yeah, it's brutal, brutal. Yeah. How about, this is a fun one with kick drum pedal. I love your kick drum pedals. I couldn't stop laughing. I'm going to have to edit myself completely out of that. Uh, um, oh, no, no. I always, well, I drill, when I get them new, I'll drill into the heels and create a thing where they're locked onto a board so they can't fly apart that way. <laughs> like, oh, that's pretty cool. I just that's, start drilling into them and modifying them right away, and I just love the... 5000s simple junky dws they clunk nice and like you said the springs you know there's only a couple you know adjustments but yeah have you heard of any of the and let's go this way with it what about cheater pedals i'm using a cheater pedal technically i'm using a double bass pedal so i don't have to have a double bass do, oh, is that do what you, you mean use by a cheater pedal or? do you use well there's some we're going to get get into this, Chris, right here. Super cheater right. pedals, double cheater pedals, triple cheater pedals, quadruple cheater pedals. Can you believe it? Does that exist? Oh, dude. I, I'm such an old dude. I didn't even know they'll like, and these have been out for like two or three years. And I'm listening to some recordings. I'm like, there's no way in hell possible that the legs of a human being can do what I'm hearing. Now, I'm not talking about, like, the Gene Hoagland's or, like, you know, your double bass stuff or, like, blast beats because it's interactive between snare and kick, and there's people that double stroke roll really cool on double bass. Heel-toe kind of shit. But they made yeah, it. Yeah. They're making pedals that have three to four beaters on them, and you, like, stall off a, you know, you you push the send button with your other with your heel and it causes everything to duplicate one stroke becomes a double stroke so it's just like playing Dude, double stroke rolls that is one of the most ridiculous things i've ever heard in my entire life <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> yes it's like seriously you man heard it here. oh boy yeah that's i've never heard of that before that's that's something new for me that's I, I do enough bitching about just like triggers, you know, and that now it's even gotten worse. It's like, really? It's like, wow. Now, what's up with crazy. the trigger thing? What are they doing? Stalling one trigger to be that beat after it? Oh, just triggers, just in general. Like, I, it's one of those things. I just don't get it. It's like, can't you play? Oh, they're playing <laughs> like, lighter. Yeah, I mean, you can't. Ah, I've, I've went on enough about that. I'm annoyed with myself at this point hearing it. Yeah, there he goes, bitching on triggers again. But, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's I, bad enough. We're not necessarily bitching. We're discussing it. Because for me, I'll bitch, but then I'll go, you know, I'll contradict my bitch and go, it's a different art form. It's a different way. I just heard some bucket head, and the drumming, like the Bass drumming is extraordinary, you know? But I can tell it is maybe an artistic form, you know, like it's a triple beater, maybe. I'm just saying, just saying, it's out that way, but I don't know. I, I hope that we cause a controversy, actually. Dude, this one, <laughs> this one, Chris, the bass drums are actually sound like a buzz roll. They're going that fast, dude. The double stroke roll, it's so fast. It's like... Uh, 
Yeah, that's crazy. It's and it's just uh, you know, it's different. Well, it's cool to hear your your spin on that. <laughs> how, how long, I don't know. How, how far back do you set your pedals? This is fun. <laughs> um, how do uh, you mean the actual questions. beater? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I have no adjustable. idea. I can... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'll bring a I'll bring a ruler next time. <laughs> yeah, <you laughs> asshole, so, you I don't know, that? man. They're pretty far back, though. I mean, it's, you they're... like punch? Then that's cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, they're not like right up near the head or anything. I mean, let's see. I'm just taking a guess. It probably, I don't know, like six or seven inches or eight or something. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're pretty far back. You know, you want to get a good thwack out of them. Yeah, so, I mean, as far as your cymbal punches, your main accents, you know. Uh, as I get yeah. older, I'm like, oh, should I move them up? And then I move them up, and I'm like, that feels like shit. No way. Yeah, you don't get... It doesn't feel right. It seems like the your leg gets interrupted, you know? It's yeah. like it's not... You're not getting the full thing out of it. <laughs> I have to ask you questions. Know? It's awesome because your answers are just awesome, you know, asking that uh, just, Dude, I'm kind of a little bit on the older side, you know, so I don't... No. All these new fucking gadgets and shit, I just don't understand. I, you know, a lot of time I, I hear about these new things, you know, like, you know, cheetah pedals or whatever, which is new to me, or just even basic things, like, you know, you know Dan's talking about playing with like a quick track or something. I'm just like, well, can't you play? <laughs> you, <laughs> you really need that? I mean, fucking, you know why you're a drummer so you can keep time? Fucking hell, man. But, uh,. <laughs> That's just me, you know? Like, I, like I don't that. understand. No, I like that. I like that a lot. That's why I ask the questions. Because, you know, there's the, the audience out there who want to ask, what do you ask this great-sounding album that you just put out? And all your albums are just so killer. We want to get into yeah. that detail, and then your response is like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> uh, I turn into a, like a cranky old man when it comes time to Great. talk about certain things, but you know, hey, that's all right. We're here with Chris Reefer, <laughs> and he's uh, he's uh, totally uh, blasting blast drum uh, equipment. Um. <laughs> <laughs> he hates everything that happened after 1978. <laughs> right on. Hmm. I used to. Did you yeah. remember those pedals back in the day? I love back in the day. It's a great term. They were called uh, 252 premieres. I had premier pedals. There were these intense pedals. Premier 252s. Huh. Sounds cool. I don't know anything about those. those are my, it sounds pretty badass. Those were my probably Psalm 9 and the Skull. Dude, and, what, what kind of. I got to ask, what kind of uh, kit did you use on that? I'd, that drum sound is fucking legendary, man. That's like the, same the coolest. Answer you just like, gave me. <laughs> you don't remember? No, it was called the Mutt. <laughs> okay, just a little bit of this and that. Well, it's exactly the same answer you gave me. That's why I was laughing. Because, okay. <laughs> because my Dude. I had a guy, thanks to John Smatlack, that if he wasn't around, there, how would there be no bolts? <laughs> oh, so man. my shit fell apart and they would always be putting it together so but it was really um, a mutt of Ludwig all Ludwig drums okay and then, dude that kid it's just so monstrous man the sound <laughs> of it and the, that snare oh my god that's like one of the coolest sounding kits in, in fucking metal you know just period it's an old Ludwig superphonic um, black beauty kind of thing do you um, have it? I don't. I don't know where that is, actually. That's really weird. It was so... That model that they had made was sort of like our old marching snares. Remember we talked about Blue Devils and... Yeah, yeah. Marching when we were younger. It had individual yeah. snare. Like, if you if your snare wire broke, you just slipped another one back into this. You just put one in at a time. It had, like, a little individual one at a time snares kind of holder it was fucking weird wow it wasn't Actually, all stuck together replace and... wire by wire huh yeah yeah wow that's crazy yeah it was killer cool. um 
Yeah. But now yeah, that's sounding good, though. it's back to the superphonic, that just that old, simple Ludwig snare. And I just threw my fives out. Like it, the fives is a great snare drum. That's what I was using with uh, Simple Mind, the last Trouble record, and started to use it on the Skull, the, which is our other our split from Trouble. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun, dude. Um, but I got rid of the fives. It's just was starting to not be able to grip and adjust the snares like finessed you know tight or loose depending on if it's a rocky kind of song or a, it needs to you know sound military or you know like harsh so i went back to this superphonic but i just added uh i like those heads that are raised i guess they're called die cast so i raised the head up uh, just with this old die cast thing that i had off the fives i threw it on a superphonic and it sounds killer I even oh, went awesome. back to the old. Remember how drums had a mute inside it, with a little felt on it. <laughs> yeah, sure. I started using that again. Like turn. I, oh, do they not? Yeah. They not make those anymore. Well, or? they do, but it just doesn't seem to be. Everyone mute snares with, the bubble gum or you know a cheese sandwich or. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to cheese sandwich. That yeah, sounds pretty good. Peak, you know, the Pink Floyd sound was like, hey, Nick, put it. Uh, can you tape that uh, ham and cheese that you're eating right there down onto that snare, please? I'm getting a little bit of ring at 1K. That could sound dynamite. <laughs> I know. Then you get the stunt, you know. So, yeah. yeah. You get something to snack on, too. <laughs> right. But it was mainly Ludwig, and then it was a complete mutt. I mean, it was... Well, there was a couple Slingerland in there, too. But it... 13 toms, you know, that kind of thing. And Man, yeah. It's, it sounds like it. It sounds monstrous. Yeah, nowadays I just play a snare and, uh, you know, one tom and... <laughs> snare and a floor, and I play flat. If I can get another one, I will. Like, at a festival, they always... They never have two floor toms. It's always like some weird kit, and you just show up with your. I just show up with a cymbal bag and sticks. Oh uh, yeah, me too. Only without the cymbals, I just show up with a pair of sti- or a couple of pair of sticks, and and that's it. But, yeah, it's the best way. You know, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, just kind of eyeball the set and get your line check or whatever you get to kind of get familiar with it and go. And the next next thing you know, yeah, it's go time. Yeah, so yeah. that's all right. Yeah, it's kind of kind of good for you to be able to just hop on any kit and just you know adapt really quick yeah it only backfired in colorado there was no drum throne so i was like on this little weird wooden stool and so oh man in the middle of the set list i'm like this is a colorado drum throne i'm glad to be here (laughs) the old Uh, west yeah that'd be a challenge there's gold in the hills yeah i'm sure it was still awesome though (laughs) it was fun that's well this is gear talk with chris yeah. gear talk Crates and sandwiches and you know that's <laughs> <laughs> the true essence right there all right well let's do it with guitar because you and let's talk a little bit about hard your hardcore group some of the things that you do that you're doing with that we'll get back to some autopsy um what yeah, explain that want. explain what you're doing uh yeah i got this uh old style uh punk slash hardcore thing going called violation wound nice. and uh it's something i started about a year ago with a couple of friends of mine from the town i live in i just kind of had an idea one day to kind of just do something simple and kind of no pressure i guess and uh but uh like punk music is something i got into pretty much around the same time as metal because back then it wasn't even weren't thinking about things like this is punk or this is metal. It's just like, ah, oh, this is fast or this is aggressive or whatever. So I kind of, you know, I've always liked those things and they kind of go together pretty well, I think. But yeah, it's kind of this idea to do like real old style, like punk, like real traditional stuff, no like blast beats or nothing that em- resembles whatsoever, like sort of like shopping mall punk or sure. <laughs> anything like that, you know, like nothing like that just real just focus on really cool short simple songs you know get in get out and hopefully they you know get stuck in your head and want to hear more so it's just a lot of fun and um 
been a couple of buddies from town. Um, the drummer, Matt O'Connell, he plays in this band called Fog of War. Nice. They're a really, really good band. And um, the bass player, Joe um, Ordery, he, uh, he used to play in Fog of War. So I kind of knew those guys from the local metal scene around here. And I, I just brought up the idea and they were into it. And we kind of formed this like power trio thing. So I'm doing a uh, guitar and that for something a little bit different, you know, it was kind of a refreshing change of pace, I guess, and yeah, it's, it's fun, man, we fucking uh, started just hammering away some stuff and built up a bunch of songs, and we recorded it independently on our own, we, we put together like 18 songs, and it's about like 25 minutes worth, you know, just real quick songs, you know, a minute, a minute and a half, and that kind of thing, and and uh, the album's actually going to come out next month, so awesome. it's pretty cool, and then we're uh, working on some more new stuff, too. So we hit the timing then on that as well. Not only, you know, Peace Fill, Autopsy, you know, Tourniquet, Attack, Saws, and Grays, and we have, let's say, what is this coming out on? Can you title this and everything for us? Yeah, well, it's just self-titled. It's just Violation Wounds, and then um, it's this label called Vic Records out of Holland, just uh, V-I-C, nice. uh, Vic Records, and... Um, yeah, they're they're a really cool label. Um, and the guy is really enthusiastic about it and everything. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, if, if you're expecting anything that sounds like autopsy, you're not gonna get that. That's cool. <laughs> you know, I do uh, do vocals, and you can you can tell it's me, but I'm not doing the you know typical death metal thing. It's got to fit with the music, so it's just definitely more of a an aggressive uh, you know old style punk kind of. I kind of equate it to like the lost punk band from 83 that never was, but cool. you know, that's kind of the sound I, I like, you know, I really like that stuff. So that's kind of uh, what I was going for, not even like imitating other bands or anything, but just sort of coming up with a sound that fit to a certain point in time, you know, rather than, okay, this is going to sound like this group or that group. It's more like, ah, oh, yeah, this is, this is what would have come out in like 1983 or so, something like that. Hey, you've been listening to Jeff Ole Olson and Chris Riefert discussing drums and music and recording, and we're glad you uh, stay tuned on uh, this station here in the Pit Radio. Signing out. <laughs>